Man, it is so good to be able to worship together. And as Kelly was talking about a little bit earlier, we know that uh, not everybody is here with us this week. I know that for some it is fall break, I believe. For others, uh, they have things that come up. And of course, those who are watching with us uh, almost every week, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us here this morning. We are in a sermon series called Back to the Start. Now, back to the start, what we are trying to talk about is over the last year and a half plus, it has been kind of a tough year. We have gone through trauma, we have gone through uh, a pandemic, we have gone through all of this stuff, and in a lot of ways, it has thrown us off our regular habits. And so what we're trying to do is go back to the start and to pick out a couple of habits that we believe that if we reclaim those habits or if we live into those habits, that they will set us on a path that will, be, uh, that will bear fruit for God. And last week we started in, a, in maybe a strange place. Because we didn't start with a habit of something that we could necessarily do. We started with the habit of the fact that in Christ, God's answer is always yes. And I hope for many of you that while you were in our worship service last week that you were able to see God's yes at work uh, here in our worship service, but also as, we, as you went through the rest of the week that you could hear God's yes time and time and time again. So now that we have listened for God's yes, after we have heard God's yes, we're going to start taking steps into things that we can do that we hope that by doing those things, God will bless us. And so we're going to talk about another habit today, a habit of worship. And so with that, would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, we celebrate you and all that you have done. And Lord, as we open your word, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would give us a word that we can rely on, because your word is trustworthy and true. And Lord, I ask that you would speak through me, with me, and even in spite of me. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the days that I would love in high school, uh, I would also hate it in high school, and I'll explain why, was awards day. Do they still do awards day these days? So I love awards day because it would get you out of maybe a morning or even an entire day of class as you watch all of those people get up and walk across the stage or go up and shake hands with the principal or whoever and receive all of these awards. It may not come to a surprise to you that I was not one of those people that would get up very often at awards day. So I would love Awards Day because it would get me out of class, but I would also hate Awards Day because, you know, I'd see all of my friends that were, you know, much better students than I was receiving all of these awards. I, I was a little jealous. You know, these, these students that would be in the top 10% or these students that would receive this kind of scholarship or these musicians that were talented and received this kind of recognition, whatever musicians do, right? I, I don't live that world, so. Uh, but there was always one award that I knew that I was pretty set on, you know, at least sharing recognition. It was the perfect attendance award. Now, I got to ask, how many of you had that perfect attendance award? One of my friends in the back is shaking her head saying, absolutely not. Nobody? Man, I'm a, I'm, hey, there you go, Savannah. You're, you're, you're stealing my spotlight over here. So, But I would always, maybe not always, but almost every single year be able to be one of those students that stood up and was able to say that I had perfect attendance, that I would always show up, I would always be going to my classes. Now again, let me be clear, this is not because I was such a good student. It was the fact that I went to high school where my mom taught, so if I ever missed a class, my mom would find out before I even got home. So I owe the perfect attendance award more to my mom than to myself, really. But, you know, perfect attendance, well, I know that is one of those awards that is going, uh, is maybe not the most important. It's not uh, one of those that we always put on our resume, per se. I do think that it says something about us. Because showing up is one of the easiest, but also most important things that we can do. Showing up is one of the easiest yet most important things that we can do. Showing up to our job on a regular basis, on time, 
showing up to our classes on time and on a regular basis, showing up to church on a regular basis, showing up to these things, whether in person or online, has a way of developing habits within us. And here's the thing about habits, is the longer that we stick with some of these habits, the more that we begin to not just form rhythms and, and, and routines in our life, but we also begin to form a character. So that showing up every single day, while it may sound bar- boring, it will also say something about your character, that you are dependable, you are reliable, and that people can trust that you will show up even when they don't expect you to. Showing up is one of the most important and, well, easiest things that we can do. So it's interesting that we, in the 21st century, in year 2021, have struggled to show up to things, even to things that happen on a regular basis. Because here's the thing, when we talk about showing up to worship on a regular basis, it's not simply about getting a perfect attendance award. It's about our habit. It's about our character that is being formed week by week. By us showing up, we're giving room for God to do something that we couldn't do ourselves. And that is to build us up. And you might be asking, build us up into what? Well, I invite you to hear these words from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. And and Peter will give us an image of what God is doing uh, as we show up time and time again. So here is what Peter writes to a congregation. He says, come to him, Come to Jesus Christ, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then, who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy. Peter writes this to a congregation that has experienced a lot of trauma, has experienced a lot of turmoil, and he is writing to them to remind them of what God is doing. And what God is up to is building up. So this is what I want you to remember for this week as we talk about the habit of worship. When we show up, God builds up. When we show up, God builds up. When we show up, God builds up. This congregation within the first century that Peter is writing to has gone through a lot of turmoil. They've gone through a lot of trauma. And in a lot of ways, they have been rejected by their families. They've been rejected by their peers. They've been rejected by their friends. And time and time again, this congregation has felt beat down, has felt torn down over and over again with, because of forces that they could not control because of forces that were out of their control, and time and time again they were beat down all because they were Christians, all because they confessed that they believed in Jesus Christ. And maybe all of us can relate to how that congregation feels about right now, because it feels like time and again that we feel beat down every time we emerge out of our house, or every time we turn on the TV, we feel torn down, and every time we maybe even show up to a place like church, that we feel like we are being torn down bit by bit by bit. And so perhaps this congregation struggling after being torn down, suffering from all of this trauma, perhaps this congregation is running out of strength, is running out of endurance to to continue to persevere in spite of these persecutions. 
And perhaps there is a temptation for them to quit showing up, to quit gathering together, to quit coming to Jesus Christ time and again because they simply can't do it. They don't have the energy. They don't have the time. They can find something else better to do with their Sunday mornings than to come together as a church and to spend time with other people. Perhaps what that is what they are struggling with. And like last week, the, the passage that we talked about, the problem that the Corinthians were facing, Paul, instead of addressing the problem head on, what Paul did was point to God. And that is what Peter does here too. Is that Peter instead of focusing necessarily always on the trauma, the turmoil that was experienced, not dismissing it, but what he does is he points them to God. He points them to the person that they were worshiping since from the very beginning, Jesus Christ. And he says, look to Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus Christ. Worship Jesus Christ, the living stone. The stone that is alive. A, a, a person that is alive, a person that is not dead, a, a, not somebody that is just stuck in the past, but someone that is alive and is still speaking to this day. But he also says a living stone, a stone that has a firm foundation, a solid foundation, a place where we can anchor ourselves. When the trauma comes, when the turmoil comes, when all of this stuff continues to overwhelm us, instead of trying to anchor ourselves in ourselves, in our own identity, Paul is say, or Peter is saying, remember the living stone, the firm foundation. Remember that Christ is your living stone. But there's more to it than just that. Because Peter goes on to say that when you come to the living stone, when you come to Jesus Christ, when you worship Jesus Christ, when you show up, God begins to go to work. God begins to build us up. And some of the things that Peter highlights that these, this church is going to be built up into is, is a spiritual household, a place where God can dwell a place where God can be sensed, a place where God can be encountered. Another place is a royal priesthood, people who announce God, people who help others see the glory of God at work, a chosen race, a race that has been set apart, a race that transcends skin color and, and ethnic culture, but a race that is chosen by God to do something a holy nation, and the kicker of all kickers in this passage is God's very own people. God is building up, all, building up this church to be all of those things. And Peter wants to remind this church, this congregation, when they show up, God builds up. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes when we think of uh, God building us up, we think of simply being encouraged or having, you know, a nice little saying that we can write, maybe on a, a sticky note that we can hang on to that would encourage us throughout the week. And, and that is part of it, for sure. But God doesn't just build us up for our own purpose, to feel comfortable, to feel encouraged. God takes it a step further. God is building up this chosen race. God is building up this spiritual household. God is building up this royal priesthood, not for their own purpose, but for his purpose. And what we see at the very end of this passage is that we see the culmination of all that God is doing, the culmination of all of these kind of descriptors for this community. And what Peter says is God is building all of you up so that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God in the world. When we show up, God is building up. He's building up a people that can announce his good news within a world that is desperate to hear some good news. He is building up this community to stand apart, to be set apart as a holy priesthood that people can look at and say, there is something different with those people. They're not, they're not torn down by all of this turmoil or all of this trauma, but they seem to be anchored in something that is solid, something that is firm, something that is unshakable. You see, God is building us up, building these congregations up, 
not just simply to sit at 1421 Reedville Sharon Road, but to go out into the world and to proclaim that Jesus Christ has risen and that Jesus Christ is Lord. One easy way that we can carry on this tradition of gathering together, of showing up, is every single Sunday morning. Is gathering together, not just with ourselves or even with our families, but to be able to gather together with people that, as Kelly was talking about, we may never see throughout the rest of the week to be able to join together in a single voice and to be able to praise the name of the God who has raised Jesus Christ from the dead. One of the ways that we can continue this this tradition of showing up is to make it a faithful commitment to regularly show up to worship, to regularly make room within our schedules for us to not be in control and to let ourselves be built up by God into this royal priesthood into this holy nation, into this chosen race. It's an easy thing, but it's rare to see regular attendance these days. And I get it. COVID has thrown all of us off. COVID has messed up all of our habits. And and again, for many, as y'all are watching online, I know that some of you are watching online to to remain safe. And so what I would say to, to many of you is just to be regular in your attendance of being there online and worshiping with us as a community so that one day as you join us again, because we do hope that you will come back into worship one day, that we, all of us, can gather together and be built up by God so that we, as a church, as a people, can go out into the world and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is one of the easiest and yet most important things to do. Now I confess, since about July, I've realized how hard it can be to get out the door. And Pam Parham is laughing at me because I'm I'm learning a lot. For those of you who don't know, I, I had my first child back in July, and so... I'm starting to learn how parents can struggle a little bit to get all the kids out the door a little bit, just on a, on a three-month basis, because, again, he can't really go anywhere. We can always take him somewhere. But I get that it's a struggle. I get that at times you're running around, maybe your living room or running around the house trying to grab everything, and you look at the clock, and, and it's running out of time, and you're still trying to grab everything. You're not even, you haven't finished your first cup of coffee, but you're trying to get everything together, and you look at the clock again, and all of a sudden it is like five minutes till church, and it's like... There's no point in going. We'll just watch it online. Or I can relate that at the end of a long week that things feel like it has battered battered you down over and over again. And and you can't even fathom the idea of waking up early in the morning to go to a a 9 a.m. service and a 9 a.m. contemporary service and to emerge out of bed and to really pull yourself up to come to church. I, I can get that from time to time. I can also imagine that on a day like today where you can tell that the seasons are starting to change and it's a little cold outside. You just want to stay under the covers and you think to yourself, well, you know what? I'll just watch online this morning. That's good. Having online worship is good. But I would say that it is not ideal. Because we don't serve a God who is simply a digital God, but a God who is incarnational a God in the flesh. There is something special about gathering to worship each and every week. So maybe you're one of those ones that sometimes struggles to get out of bed or sometimes struggles to get all the kids together and you wonder whether or not you should even show up on Sunday mornings. And I would say absolutely. Because again, when we show up, we are forming habits. We are forming something in ourselves. But more importantly, God is forming in us something that we can't do ourselves. That week by week, as we are showing up, God is laying stone by stone into our character that will last years and years beyond what we can recognize. So on those weeks where it may be a struggle to get out of bed and on those weeks where you can't corral the kids or on those weeks where you just can't seem to get going and everything seems to be going wrong, just remind yourself that week by week as you show up, God, week by week, 
stone by stone, brick by brick, is building you up into a holy nation, into a chosen race, into someone that looks a little bit more like Jesus Christ so that you can go out into this world filled with bad news and share the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what does this kind of character look like? What is this kind of habit of worship that transcends even something that we can do ourselves? What does that look like? Well, I can't get this image out of my mind to, to, to realize what a lifetime of worship can form in each of us. Years ago, I went to a nursing home, and I was a part of a church that would on occasion do a worship service for a nursing home, and they would uh, go probably maybe once a month, maybe once every two months or so. And this month, we were having this worship service in the memory care unit of this nursing home. Now, for those of you who may not know, the memory care unit is for those who are suffering with, of course, memory loss, but dementia, and and maybe even to the point where they are so far gone that they don't even recognize their family members anymore. They can't even tell you where they grew up anymore. They can't even maybe at some points tell you even their own names. So they have in some ways forgotten everything. They have forgotten who they were. They have forgotten all of their memories. And and for many of us, that is one of the saddest existences. It's one of the saddest places to be that you can't remember those stories. You can't remember those people that you love. You can't remember all of these things. And so you see all of these people that are being wheeled into this, this area, this maybe dining room area to gather together for worship. And all of a sudden, there is a, a song that begins to play on the piano. Maybe you know it. It's a, it's a hymn called Amazing Grace. And these people, they can't remember anything, but after a lifetime of worship, can sing the verses of Amazing Grace. They can sing the verses of How Great Thou Art. They can sing the verses of Blessed Assurance. But that is only possible because they showed up every week. They showed up and God built them up into something they couldn't be on their own. So God forbid you imagine yourself in one of those places. Or God forbid that you imagine yourself in years to come where your memory begins to slip. You you, you begin to not recognize certain places. But the one thing that you know you can rely on is that living stone, that firm foundation. And even as your memory slips, even as you approach uh, your heavenly reward, you know that you, when that song plays, Amazing Grace, And for many of us today, our our amazing grace, my chains are gone. When they play that song, you'll be able to sing those words. Not based on your strength, but based on the strength of the God who has built you up over the years. When we show up, God builds us up. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.